special guest here today, and we're so glad to have you joining us uh, here on this Easter Sunday. So um, I heard the story of a husband and wife that had been married for 57 years, but it was a, not an attractive relationship. And in fact, uh, the husband would say, she just tears me apart all the time, just bickers and complains. I can't do anything right. And so on their 60th anniversary, he decided, well, maybe what I'll do is she's always wanted to go to Jerusalem, go where Jesus was. So I'm, I'm going to take her there. Maybe, maybe she'll lighten up a little bit if I do that. And so he takes her all the way to Jerusalem, and while they're there, she dies. And so the government comes to him and says, we are so sorry for your loss. And we want to let you know, here's your options. We can fly your wife's body back to the United States, but it's going to cost $52,000 to be able to do that. Or we can bury her here, right here in the Holy Land, and we can do that for $175. To which the man said, fly her back to the States. The guy was kind of confused. He said, $175 here. He goes, fly her back to the States. He said, sir, I'm just trying to understand what's your line of logic here. And he said, you know, I read about this one guy who died here in Jerusalem. They buried. Three days later, he was resurrected. I can't take that chance. Stay with me. It gets better, I promise. <laughs> We're so glad you guys are here for this Easter Sunday to be a part of this celebration like this. You know, over the, um, the last couple of weeks, we have been teaching a series here at Lake Country. And uh, in this series, we've been looking at seven times that Jesus used this phrase, I am. And we, and we actually, the very first time we see that term, I am, is when Moses was talking to God. You remember the burning bush thing? And Moses asked him the question. He says, God, who, what's your name? Who shall I tell people, you know, is sending me? And God's response was, I am that I am. And that exact same phrase Jesus is going to use in the New Testament when he tells people who he is. Seven times recorded by uh, one of the closest followers of Jesus, which is interesting because he was a teenager at the time. You know, we always get these, these images of the Lord's Supper and everybody's got these long beards and, you know, fluffy bread. And, and no, these guys were young bucks when they hung out with Jesus. And John was a teenager when he was with Christ. But John would record seven times that Jesus would use this phrase, I am. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the vine. I am the door. And today we finish how appropriately on this Easter Sunday with the words that Jesus would give when he would say, I am the resurrection and the life. And so if you've got a Bible, I want to invite you. i got two places I want to take you to today. i got two places that I want to take you to. And uh, one is going to be in the actual story. Both of them are going to be in the book of John, so we'll make it easy. But one is going to be in chapter 11. And then we're also going to look at the actual Easter story here appropriately in John chapter 20. So John chapter 11, just hold a place there, and John chapter 20. Um, when we give this resurrection account, what we've got to keep in mind is that this really started back on Thursday. Thursday would have been what's called uh, the Passover meal. Many of us know it as the Last Supper. And after that, Jesus would take his disciples. They would leave there. They would go out into a garden, and that's where Jesus would be arrested late at night. They would take Jesus and Later, in the next day, early in the next day, there were several court cases, illegal court cases, that took place to try Jesus. You see, even though the Jews wanted him put to death because he claimed to be God, the only way that they could put somebody to death is with Roman approval because they didn't have that authority. So Jesus went through the trials, and the people screamed, crucify, and Rome finally just went, 
fine, we're washing our hands of this. Put them to death. And the scripture tells us that how on that Friday, about 9 o'clock in the morning, he would have been crucified on this place called Golgotha, Calvary, the place of the skull. And he would be crucified there, and, and for six hours that Friday, Jesus would hang suspended between heaven and earth. And the scripture says this, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy set before him, he endured. What was the joy? You were. You were that joy. We'll explain that in a minute. Jesus was put into the grave on that Friday. Saturday was a silent day. And then Sunday morning, three days, we come to our text. So in John chapter 20, it says this, early on the very first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one that Jesus loved. Okay, just real quick, I got to hit this. The one that Jesus loved. Who is that? It's the guy writing this book. Come on, man. There's some humor here, folks, but you got to see it. So John refers to himself as the one that Jesus loved. And so here he is. But it gets funnier. Stay with me. Stay with me. Okay. Uh, uh, they, they have taken him, uh, the Lord, out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples, who we're talking about one guy here, started out for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Really? Is anybody picking up on the competition here? It's, it's not only the one that Jesus loved, but he's going, yes, and he's the faster, just saying, right? So here it is. And he outran him. He bent over and he looked at the strips of linen lying, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and he went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first. Also, seriously, when I meet John, I'm like, really, guy? Really? But he went inside and he saw and he believed. Powerful words right there. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them what, what, what the things that she, they had said to her. Now, what we want to be able to see here is this, is that Jesus had told everybody. He had told especially his disciples the cross was not a surprise, definitely not to, to Jesus. He knew the cross was coming. That's why he was sent. But he told his disciples left and right what was going to be taking place. He let them know, I'm dying for the sins of the world. He let them know, I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be put to death. He let them know, I'm going to be hung, crucified on a cross. But three days later... I'm going to be resurrected. So he shared this story with them left and right. Now, let me take you to our other text. Other text that we're going to look at is in John chapter 11. And so if you've got your Bibles, flip over to that John chapter 11. Because we're going to go into the story 
and you're going to see how they tie together. We're going to read the story of a man named Lazarus and how Lazarus was resurrected from the dead. Now, I do want you to know this because to me this was cool. The event of John chapter 11, Lazarus being raised from the dead, and John chapter 20, Jesus being resurrected from the dead, is not a far time span. These events are close together. So people have got this in their mind, what we're about to read here right now. In John chapter 11, verse 1, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one that you love is sick. Verse 4, when he heard this, Jesus said, The sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her, and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Wow, that's an interesting text. First off, do you think... That Mary and Martha, because you got Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. Lazarus is sick, and Mary and Martha write him a letter to Jesus, say, will you come heal Lazarus? He's sick. Quick question. Do you think that in Mary and Martha's mind, in their faith, do you think they believe that Jesus could heal their brother? Yeah. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been saying, hey, come heal him, right? So they believed that they had enough faith. They had enough understanding of Jesus to know that he was a healer. But did they have enough comprehension to understand that he could resurrect their brother from the dead? You see, Mary and Martha, they were looking for a resuscitation and Jesus was looking for a resurrection. So they sent word to Jesus and Jesus Stayed where he was. Verse 16. Then Thomas, also called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us go that we also may die with him. <laughs> I had to add that in because uh, we had a good Friday service here over in our chapel. We had a wonderful time, but we talked about Thomas. Thomas gets such a bad rap, right? Because we all know him, Doubting Thomas. It's Doubting Thomas. Can, can I just shine a little bit different light on Thomas so that when you get to heaven and you run into Thomas, right? It's not an awkward moment. Like, Thomas, how are you? Doubting, right? I'm trying to help you out. Realize that Jesus is saying, hey, look, my, my, my friend Lazarus, we, we need to go see him. But the area where they had to go back to where Lazarus was, was an area where they had just tried to kill Jesus a short time ago. So Jesus is going, hey, remember that city where they tried to kill us? Yeah, we're going back. And the guys are like, yeah, about that. And it was Thomas that spoke up and said, if we're going to die, let's die for Jesus. Come on. So they make the trip back. And, and the scripture in verse 17 is actually going to say this. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the, day, in the tomb four days. Why is that important? Why is that text even in there that Lazarus was in the ground for four days? For, for this simple reason, the Jewish people believed that the spirit would leave a body but then would hover. And for about four days, the spirit would hover over the dead body and could come back in at any time. So Jesus made sure that it was four days so that people knew it was by the power of God of what they're about to experience. Verse 20, shoot down to verse 20. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, keep in mind Lazarus is dead four days now. He's already in a tomb. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Verse 21, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, can I tell you something? That's not a compliment. That's not a compliment that she's going, you know what? You're powerful. And had you been here, I know you couldn't. No. It was a dig. She was saying that if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Have you ever been there with God? Have you ever been there with God where you shook your fist or you didn't understand why the divorce, you didn't understand why the death. 
You didn't understand why the firing. You didn't understand why the bad doctor's report. Have you ever been at a place where you're going, God, I don't understand? Have you ever been at a place, whether it was physically out loud or just inside, where you shook your fist at God and said, why? I don't get it. I don't understand. Why would you do that? I know I have. But can I share something just real quick? When you don't understand his way, trust his heart. I hope you hear God whisper in your ear, I've got a plan. I've got a plan. And Mary didn't understand, and she was upset with Jesus, and she called out to him. She was angry. Verse 23, Jesus said to him, what what Jesus is about to do is he's he's about to remind her that the Jewish people knew that there was going to be a resurrection. They knew that the children of God, there would be a day after death when all of the children of God of Israel would be resurrected. And, And he speaks this. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. The Jewish people believed that there was going to be this ultimate calling of the dead and that all of the people, all the children of Israel would be resurrected. And so she looks at Jesus and goes, I know that he'll be resurrected in that day. And Jesus looks at her and goes, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection. And my friends right there, that is a powerful scripture. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am. I am the resurrection and the life. And the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. You know what Jesus was saying right here? Life doesn't stop just when you take your last breath. I, I, I know there are uh, a lot of people who believe and teach adamantly that this is it. This is it. We're going to go through life and we collect stuff and we do stuff. Hopefully you do some good stuff. But at the end of it, when you take that last breath, that's it. There's no more. We just die. We disintegrate at that point. Even even Shakespeare inside of Macbeth, he'd write these words. Life is but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by idiots. Full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. There's a lot of people who believe that. That believe that what you and I are in right now, this is all there is. Okay, can I camp there for just half a second? What if they're right? Scott, what if, what if they're right? And, and once you take your last breath, that's it. There is no heaven. There is no eternity. That's just, it ends right there. Scott, what if that is it? Okay, well, if that's it, can I, can I just say this? I lived a cool life. Amen. I mean, seriously, I've got an incredible bride. I've got beautiful children. Forget them. I got granddaughters. Ah. <laughs> oh. It just thinks pop is something cool, all right? And, and you know, when we found out, yay, you're going to be grandparents. They're like, my kids are coming up saying, Dad, what do you want to be called? I'm like, I'm not ready to be a grandparent. They're like, Dad, what do you want to be called? I'm like, yeah, Mr. Crenshaw's fine, you know? <laughs> I've lived a pretty cool life. I get to do life in this community of believers called Lake Country Church. I have relationships with this tribe, with this community. I I would tell you this. If you say to me, Scott, there isn't anything after this life, I would say that I've had a really good life. If you're right. But what if you're wrong? What if you're wrong? 
And there is an eternity that we are a part of right now. Eternity, can I say this? Eternity doesn't happen when we die. We're already in eternity. We're in the process of it. All we're simply going to do is transition from one place to the next. It's literally if I walked off this platform and I walked out of this room and I walked out into the hallway, that's what death is like. You're going to transition. The question is, where will you transition to? So when Jesus said these words, he said, I am the resurrection. What he was simply saying was this, there's more to it than just this. And I am that resurrection that will take you into the next chapter. Well, Scott, what, 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 what do you mean, the, the, this next chapter? Okay, let me just hit it very simply like this. God created every single one of us. He created. You were created. Scripture talks about it left and right. That he has a game plan for you. And he created us. Just like Adam and Eve, he, he created them and he put them in the garden. And that, and that garden is a beautiful picture of, of, of relationship, of intimacy. And it was inside of the garden. I'll, I'll just stay with those guys for half a second. It was inside of the garden that Jesus pointed out. He said, All, everything in this garden, baby, it's yours. It's yours. I got one tree. Stay away from it. Why do you do that? Because it's a choice. You see, love without a choice is not a choice. You become a robot. So God had to give a choice. When he pointed the tree in the garden, he said, look, you choose. You choose to do life your way or you choose to do life my way. And when Adam and Eve went over there and they ate of the tree, something happened. God spoke these words and he said to them, if you eat of that one, that one tree, you will surely die. When they ate of the tree, did they fall over dead? Was it like crunch? Ah! No. But there was a spiritual death that took place. I had one time I was on an airplane flying to go speak somewhere. And I'm writing this sermon down. And, and, and I'm in these seats that we're actually facing each other. And this lady sitting across from me, she's reading her little magazine. And the Holy Spirit just kind of spoke to my heart just real quick. And just went, Scott, tell that lady about me. I was like, okay. How? <laughs> and I'm telling you, Holy Spirit just spoke in that little still small voice and just went, dude, you're writing a sermon. Read it to her. Okay. And I looked at her and I said, excuse me, ma'am. I said, I'm writing some stuff down here. I wonder if I could read this to you and just get your thoughts on it. And she was sitting there with her little Cosmo magazine, right? She's like, why, sure. And I start reading her this Bible study, right? It, it, what surprised me was she was getting into it. She was like, oh, that's good. Oh, I like that. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But then finally I got to the word sin. And she goes, oh, stop right there. She's like, excuse me? She goes, I don't believe in sin. I said, really? Hey, that's all right. You know what? A lot of people don't. You know why? They don't know what it means. I, I looked at her. I said, ma'am, can I explain to you just real quick? Do you know what the word sin means? Sin is actually an archery term. Archery, bow and arrows. You know? <laughs> archery. And it simply means this, to miss the mark, to miss the mark. If I had a target up here on the stage and you took a bow and arrow and you shot and hit anywhere except for the bullseye, it would be called sin to miss the mark. To which right then that lady looked at me and she goes, okay, Scott, so what is the mark I'm supposed to aim for? And I looked at her and I said, a life of 100% perfection with no mistakes. I looked at her and said, ma'am, can you tell me right now that you've never made a mistake? She goes, no, I can't say that. Nobody can say that. <laughs> Opened up the scripture and says, and that's why it says right here that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The scripture is going to go on and it's going to say this in the same book. It's going to say the wages or the price tag of sin is death. 
Now, tell me if I'm missing this. Tell me if I'm missing this. I know there's a, there's a lot of us that what we do is we, we think, okay, you know, Scott, as long as I can do more good stuff in life than bad stuff, I think I'm going to be okay with God. So how much is enough? How much, how, how much will it take? My, my, my middle son, Sam, he was always a, a little, dude, little dude. He was a giver. I mean, people would come over, and he just gave stuff away all the time. It's like, Sam, where's that truck I got you? I gave it away. He, just, he didn't feel like it was a good play day unless he gave you something. So this one time, we go out to eat, and we're there with the whole family. And, you know, during this time, I was traveling a lot, so we ate out a lot, and my family knew the routine. The very end of the meal, hey, you know, we're getting this. Hey, get the queso. Hey, get the guacamole at the table. Hey, uh, but at the end of it, somebody's got to pay. That night, the guy walks up, man, and he, he lays the bill down on the table, and Sam reaches over and goes, I got it. Right? He's like five, maybe. He goes, I got it. What I did not notice was that my son had emptied out his piggy bank. And he walks up, and he hit, he's got change, and so he starts bringing out all this change. Little five-year-old putting all this change on the table, right? Oh, it's cute. It's adorable. Whoa. But was it enough? He gave everything he had, but it still wasn't enough. And that's why the Scripture says, Jesus talking, he says this, while you were yet missing the mark, I paid. Some of you have heard that song, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. And when Jesus shed his blood, he took all of your jealousy, your bitterness, your envy, your materialism, your drugs, your pornography. He took that all upon himself. And he, he said this, I got it. I got it. And there would probably be a lot of us in this room right now that would say, oh, Scott, I love that story. I've heard that since I was a kid. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. God created us to know him, and, but our choices separated us from God. But Jesus went to the cross and he paid. He took our place. Oh, Scott, I love that story. You know, I think majority of people would say, I know this story, but it's the last point that changes everything, which is this. But have you received it? I can have a gift up here on the platform right now. It's just a Bishop Santos, big old gift. It's got expensive wrapping all over it. To Bishop from Scott. Is it Bishop's? <laughs> Some of you are sitting there going, it's a trick question, don't answer. It's not his until he receives it. How many people, like Jay was talking about earlier, you know the facts. There's probably not a lot of us in this room that would say, you know what, I think I'm good enough for God, bring it on. Probably not. But probably most of us here would say, I know that I fall short. Some of us will try religion. You'll be at church. I got to stop cussing. I got to quit drinking so much. I got to stop. Can I tell you this? It's by grace that you're saved. Through faith. And not of yourself. It is a gift from God. And that gift's been paid for. That gift, man, Jesus shed his blood for the joy set before him. He endured the cross. What was the joy? You. You were the joy. But he says, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone would open that door to me, I will come in and begin a relationship. A relationship. Did you hear that? Because so many times we think, we'll enter in and then I become Baptist. I become Catholic. I become cares. No, you become his. 
Jesus said, I'm the resurrection. There's more to it than this. And I am that resurrection. But he also said this, I'm the life. The resurrection means you can trust me for eternity after this life. When he said, I'm the life, that means we can trust him with the life that we're living right now. Because tell me if I'm missing this. There's a lot of us who go, you know, I, I, I want Jesus kind of as that, that eternity insurance. I want him for fire insurance. I need Jesus for when I die. Can I tell you something? You need Jesus for now. He said, I'm not only the resurrection. He goes, I'm the life. And in John 10, 10, he said, I have come. In the sweet by and by in the sky when we die? No, right here in the nasty now and now. And he says, whoever calls on my name will 